Thanks, Erica, and thanks for everyone for coming out this morning. I work on a wide range of large research projects from naming BC fossil dragonflies to probing the evolutionary history of robber flies, but today I want to talk about some small projects I've pursued off and on for years. These are rather serendipitous publications that you could call citizen science. People get in touch with us in many ways looking for identifications of their bug finds. We love to help because it's our calling and because it's lots of fun sharing discoveries with other keen observers. And sometimes it's truly, truly exciting because the experience results in a publication that the, that the discoverer can participate in. Way back in 1976, I met George Dirksen, a mill worker in Tassos. George had an entomological background, but he'd never found a job in biology. He was obsessed with dragonflies. He collected what he thought was the undiscovered lot of the swift forktail, an uncommon damselfly in BC. And George wanted me to help him describe this new find in a scientific paper. And this is a page from that paper that we eventually published, a unique scientific discovery. In more recent times, the advent of digital, digital photography and specimen identification websites, such as Bug Guide, iNaturalist, eFauna BC, and so on, have made it much easier for us to find new bugs in BC and Canada and wherever else you live. Gavin just mentioned his lizard data collection site on iNaturalist. This and other sites are important and useful social media sites that can significantly support biological research. So here's a screenshot of Bug Guide, and the theme in these postings is usually, what the heck is this? That's what that actually says there. What the heck is this? More about this record later. Most of the participants in these sites are not professional biologists. They're everyday people like you, who just happen to be interested in taking pictures of interesting things. Unusual records regularly pop up on these websites. Even if you don't monitor them, monitor them yourself, you can bet your friends will let you know if they think they've found something interesting. And it's no surprise that the internet has become a powerful tool for museum biologists recording species occurrence and distribution. Just ask Gavin. Such discovery and subsequent documentation are critical functions of natural history museums. The photos I'm talking about are often excellent in quality and usefulness in ways far beyond the documentation of the original record. Most of them can be successfully used in, in books, in scientific articles, in scientific journals, websites, blogs, and other useful venues. The quality of many of these pictures is phenomenal, which is why you can often identify them right from your computer. We try hard to inspire non-science scientist citizens and get them involved in the discovery of diverse and fascinating organisms. And the publication of their finds is a good way to get this done. More than a couple of people might be involved in one of these little publications. For example, Claudia Copley, our entomological collections manager, and I once produced a paper with two other authors on an Australian fly that somehow settled on Vancouver Island. And I'm now involved in a paper about dragonflies moving north into the Arctic that has six other authors, half of whom are not entomologists. One of them, Ryan Lucas, is an Inuit from Banks Island where he photographed the most northerly record of a dragonfly in Canada. I'd like to give you three more recent examples of these little publications. I heard about the discovery of this new bug directly, not via the internet. In 2016, Russ Pym, a Victoria naturalist, photographed a large and unusual damselfly in the South Okanagan. 
Victoria is a small town. Do any of you know Russ? No? Well, well, there is Russ. <laughs> Perfect timing. I didn't even see you back there. Well, as you can see, there's lots of those photographers out there everywhere around, just waiting to be discovered. Russ, you can come and tell your story. <laughs> Russ thought the damsel, damselfly might be the California spread wing and contacted us here at the museum to confirm the record. And I agreed with Russ's identification. This is one of his photos. I knew that the species had been spreading slowly northwards through Washington state over the last decade. And here it was, a new Canadian insect. Was this movement related to climate warming? Maybe further study will tell. But for now, the record forms the baseline for understanding its future expansion in Canada. There's the South Okanagan where Russ found those damselflies in three different places, all the way from Asuias near the border up to Okanagan Falls. In 2018, my wife Joan collected two small dead flies with prettily marked wings on a windowsill at home. Being a jaded curator emeritus, I wasn't interested enough at the time to identify them. In my defense, I don't usually study these sorts of flies. So I put the specimens in the museum collection for further examination. But about the same time, Talmadge Bachman and Eriko Yamamoto dropped in the, at the museum to show Joel Gibson a couple of weird flies they'd found in their Victoria home. Victoria is a really small place. I'm sure some of you at least know who Tal Bachman is. As well as an infrequent fly collector, Tal is a well-known rock musician, just like his father, Randy. So anyone can do this, as you can see. They also told Joel about an earlier sighting that they had posted on Bug Guide, where it became a bit of a sensation among some fly aficionados. This posting is that screenshot I showed you earlier. The fly was Toxinevera mulibris, this fellow here, a European species completely new to North America. The male has a striking display. He flutters those patterned wings like little flags. That's the English name for the family, flutterflies. Soon Joel, who does study these sorts of flies, came across Joan's two specimens in the collection and identified them as Toxinevera too. And the records just kept on coming. On iNaturalist, Andrew Simon and Lauren Magner reported a dead one discovered in a household cupboard on Galliano Island. Thomas Barbin photographed this one in Victoria and posted it on Bug Guide. Joel and I wrote a paper on the find and all the other specimens. We included Thomas's photo and credited all the participants for their help, their specimen donations, and the use of their photos. How did Toxin ever get here? Why are all the known North American records from the Victoria area? We're not sure, but there is one potential benefit. This fly kills carpet beetles, among other insects, and who knows, may even eventually help control these pesky museum and household pests. Our museum conservatives are probably ecstatic. <laughs> For years, I had searched the Okanagan Valley grasslands for robber fly the genus Promachus, big fancy flies, many with bright white tips to their tail. Some species live in Washington state, not too far south of the US border. Why shouldn't they occur in BC's dry valleys? They should be easy to find if they're there. They're about an inch long, it's a big fly. They buzz loudly when they fly around and they have that white tail light and it's unmistakable. But I didn't have any luck. But last fall I found pictures of Promachus dimidiatus on iNaturalist from grasslands in Vernon. What the heck? The specimens were discovered by Tyson Ehlers, a mushroom expert who was conducting a biological inventory of the Vernon military lands. And this is one of Tyson's photos. This robber fly is not known from Washington. It didn't arrive from the south by the usual valley route. 
like Russ's damselfly did. It's known elsewhere in Canada as a rare inhabitant of the prairies. The genus and species are new to BC. It's hard to believe the fly has recently arrived in BC from east to the Rockies. How did I miss finding it for all these years? I have no idea. <coughs> right now, Tyson and I are writing the paper describing this unusual discovery. Museum research in biology usually involves the solving of mysteries. Involving the public through co-authorship is a personal and rewarding way to do this. And it's a good way to further this museum's goal of documenting the diverse natural history of the province. These are not just random studies. Together, they help build a picture of BC's dynamic and changing ecosystems. I thank the museum for its research program, one that encourages us to create knowledge for the people of BC, Canada, and the world. And I thank all the others that help. There's the North Okanagan, where the, the uh, fly was found, where the circle is, Vernon in the square. And I thank all the others that helped, and you too for being here today. Thank you.